Admiral Nimitz commanded the Pacific Fleet. That means he was top dog responsible for half of the fighting during World War II. How did he become such a great leader? And what was this guy all about? We went over to the National Museum of the Pacific War in Fredericksburg, Texas to talk to General Hagee about Admiral Nimitz. They have lots of cool things over there from World War II, like airplanes, a PT boat, and the interior of a destroyer. All of this stuff was used by the U.S. Navy at the time, and most of the sailors weren't much older than us. Admiral Nimitz was born here in Fredericksburg, Texas, and spent the first six years of his life here. Before he was born, his father unfortunately passed away, and his grandfather, who owned a hotel here, became his father figure. His grandfather had also served in the German Merchant Marine, and he gave Admiral Nimitz advice. He said, the sea is a lot like life. It is tough. You have to study and learn as much as you can. Do the very best job that you're capable of doing. Most importantly, do not worry about things that you cannot control. Nimitz's grandfather taught him three important life lessons. First, not to be afraid of hard work. You won't believe what he did to get into the Naval Academy. In high school, he divided his time at home between studying and doing the chores. He would get up early in the morning, study, do the chores, go to school, come back, do the chores around the hotel, and then study again. He knew that since his family was quite poor, he was probably not going to have the opportunity to go to college. He wanted to become a surveyor, but he saw some army cadets on maneuvers in and around Kerrville like their uniforms and realized that if he went to West Point, he could go to college and the government would pay for it. When he contacted his congressman, the congressman told him that all the West Point slots were gone, but he had a competitive examination for the Naval Academy coming up in April. Time was about January, so he got up earlier, around 3.30 in the morning. He would study for the competitive exam, then he would study for high school, then he would do his chores, then he actually ran to school to ensure that he stayed in physical shape, and when he came home, he would do the chores, he would study, for high school and he studied for the competitive exam going to a bed around 11 o'clock and then he would do it again the following day. In April, he went down to San Antonio and he took this competitive exam and he came out number one and he ended up going to the Naval Academy in 1901. He worked like a dog and didn't let anything stop him. I've got to step up my game. And for the second life lesson, believe it or not, Admiral Nimitz loves to tell this story about a huge mistake he made. When Nimitz was at the Naval Academy, they had just completed a new set of barracks called Bancroft Hall. And the first class midshipmen thought it would be a good idea to have a party. And they also thought it would be even a better idea to have some beer, even though it was not allowed at that time. So they cut cards to decide who was going to go out in town and get the beer, and Nimitz lost. So he took a suitcase and he went out to a tailor shop that was known for providing beer to uh, discerning customers, and went in and was loading up his suitcase with beer, and he noticed another gentleman also uh, picking up some beer. He went back to the Naval Academy, they had a great party. The next day, he went into class and the gentleman that he had seen in the tailor shop picking up beer happened to be a lieutenant commander that was teaching his class. And much to his surprise, the teacher never said anything to him about being out there picking up beer, which was against regulations. The lieutenant commander didn't bust him, but decided to give him a break. He realized how close he came to being kicked out and decided to obey the rules from then on. And then he learned to overlook the mistakes of younger officers. I'm impressed. I don't have to call everybody out all the time. He learned a third lesson from his grandfather. As a young officer, Admiral Nimitz messed up big time. Let's see how he handled that. He was commanding officer of a ship in the Philippines as a young ensign. At night, he ran it aground on a sandbar. 
He tried hard to get that ship off the sandbar because he knew this was not really good for his career, but he was unable to move it. So he remembered his grandfather's advice, don't worry about things you have no control over. So he went down below, grabbed the cot, set it up on deck, and went to sleep. He was in fact court-martialed, and he stood up and said, I take responsibility, I did it. He was found guilty of dereliction of duty, and he was reprimanded. Pretty brave. Instead of quitting the Navy, he learned from his mistakes and decided to pursue his career. So a big lesson he learned is his mistakes don't have to define him. I've got to remember that one. Like you, I thought that history didn't have anything to do with my life today. Then I discovered that some of my favorite movies and video games are about World War II. Did you know the US basically saved the world from being conquered by the Nazis and Japanese? Thousands of sailors, soldiers, and airmen showed uncommon valor, in many cases giving their lives up to preserve our freedom. Pretty amazing. And there's this one guy, Admiral Nimitz, who started out poor and fatherless to become the man who led the US to victory in the Pacific. We're going to get to know this guy and how he did it. And while we're at it, we're going to show some amazing paintings of World War II by Texas artist Tom Lee. In the late 1930s, the commander of the Pacific Fleet uh, position came open in Hawaii. And President Roosevelt wanted to assign Admiral Nimitz to that position. That position was the second most important position in the U.S. Navy at that time, essentially in charge of all the Navy ships. So after being offered this position by the President, Admiral Nimitz refused. The second most important job in the Navy. And his rationale behind that was, he said there are too many officers who are senior to me, and by putting me in that position, it would hurt the Navy. And the last thing he wanted to do was hurt the Navy. So in his mind, the Navy was much more important than him accepting that very important position. Approximately a year later, on the 7th of December 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. since Admiral Kimmel was the Admiral in charge and therefore was responsible for the defense of that island, the President fired him. Think about that. If Admiral Nimitz would have accepted that job, he would have been in Kimmel's place and he would have been fired. After the attack on Pearl Harbor and Admiral Kimmel being fired, Roosevelt called Admiral Nimitz and told him he was going to take command of the Pacific Fleet and that he had no choice now. Admiral Nimitz arrived on Christmas Eve there in Pearl Harbor and as he toured around, he was shocked at the devastation uh, of not only the ships but the entire facility. And he knew how poor morale was, not only there in Hawaii, but back in the United States. But as he looked around, he said, you know, it could have been a lot worse. Number one, our aircraft carriers were at sea, so they were not touched. Number two, the significant fuel farm that we have here in Hawaii was also not touched. Number three, our ship repair facility was also not attacked. And think about it. This is Hawaii. The only way you get fuel to Hawaii is to bring it across. And if the ship repair facility had been attacked, it would have had to have been rebuilt. And all of that would have had to come from the United States. So he saw that even though it's bad, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. 
Admiral Nimitz was an awesome leader. He knew managing morale or people's attitudes was as important as strategy. He didn't focus on the negative, but focused on the positive in devastating situations and gave people hope. I've got to stop looking on the dark side and be more positive like Admiral Nimitz. Do you believe everything you see on social media? Have you ever seen something that turned out not to be true or had to buy a spin on it? Back in World War II, we didn't have social media. Everything came from TV and magazines, like Life magazine. Do you think reporting could have been biased back then? Tom Lee, very famous Texas artist, was actually commissioned by Life magazine to report on the war in the Pacific. And in 1942, he was on board the USS Hornet, a aircraft carrier located in the Pacific. And he spent three months on that ship, talking with the sailors, writing stories, and drawing pictures. When it was time to rotate, uh, he was asked to come back to Pearl Harbor, which was relatively standard because they wanted to review his work to ensure that it was okay to publish what he had done out to the public. But to his surprise when he arrived, a commander met him at the airport uh, there in Pearl Harbor and said the Admiral would like to see you. That was really quite, uh, quite unusual. The commander never said a word about why uh, the Admiral wanted to see him and he sat down with Admiral Nimitz and Admiral Nimitz looked through his artwork uh, was actually quite engrossed with his artwork and told him I wish I had your talent Thank you Admiral I have a good feeling about that one And then he paused and he said you know Tom I, I know that you grew very close to the sailors on board that ship. I can see it from your, from your work here. And I know you've been traveling the last four or five days. And I, I hate to tell you, but... We lost the horn last night. And Tom reported in his writings that when Admiral Nimitz said that, there were tears in Nimitz's eyes. And Tom Lee also reported that after he left the office, he cried too. As an artist correspondent, Tom Lee thought it was his duty to report the war truthfully. He didn't put his own spin on it. Both he and Admiral Nimitz cared about the people that they served with. Compassion for others made Tom Lee an amazing artist and Admiral Nimitz an exceptional leader. Nimitz wasn't a yes man. In one of the most decisive battles of the Pacific, he had the guts to take on the head honchos back in DC. In April of 1942, there was a Battle of Coral Sea. It was sort of a standoff between us and the Japanese. We lost a couple of carriers. So in May of 1942, there was intelligence that the Japanese were on the move somewhere. In fact, we could not find where their carriers were located. There was a disagreement between the staff in Pearl Harbor, Admiral Nimitz staff, and the staff back in Washington working for the Joint Chiefs. Back in the Joint Chiefs, they thought that the Japanese were going to Southwest Pacific. Admiral Nimitz's staff thought they were going to an island called Midway. Fortunately, we were able to decipher the Japanese coded traffic. Even though it was coded, they had two letter names for various locations. So Admiral Nimitz's key intelligence officer came up with an idea to send out a message in the clear to see if the Japanese responded to it. And so he reported in the clear that there was a water shortage at Midway. Within a day, the Japanese had responded, oh, we just learned there's a water shortage. Based on that and the significant study that Admiral Nimitz had done on intelligence, he was convinced that's where the Japanese were going. So he had the fleet ready to meet them in Midway 
And in June of 1942, the Battle of Midway occurred. We beat the Japanese the first time the Japanese Navy had been beat at sea. It was a tremendous victory for the United States and actually a turning point in the war. A turning point not only in the Pacific, but back in the United States where people started to believe that we had a chance to win that war. It must have been hard to disagree with his bosses, the Joint Chiefs back in Washington, about something so important. But Nimitz had the moral courage to prove he was correct. As a result, the U.S. won the Battle of Midway and turned the tide of the war. Sometimes we have to take a stand for what we believe in. Island hopping isn't a planned vacation, but it was a strategy developed by our leaders to defeat Japan. After Midway, Admiral Nimitz looked at the significant expanse of the Pacific. It takes a ship, even today, about 30 days to go from San Francisco to Japan. How was he going to attack that geographic area? They came up with the idea of island hopping. The Japanese had located forces on various islands throughout the Pacific. So what they decided to do was go to one island that would have an airfield so they could use it afterwards and a harbor so they could use it afterwards, take that island from the Japanese. Once they had consolidated there, then they would hop to the next island. In some cases, even though there were Japanese on the island, they would ignore that island because they were of no consequence and they did not help project force towards Japan. One of the islands that we landed on was Peleliu, and the Marines were in charge of that particular landing, and it was one of the bloodiest to date, the bloodiest landing that, uh, that we had made. Tom Lee had gone from the Navy over to the Marine Corps, was actually reporting to Life magazine on what the Marines were doing. And based on his experience, he knew that the only way that he could actually report what was happening was to be with the Marines on the island. So he actually landed in the second wave on Peleliu, and in the book that he wrote, Peleliu, he talks about Two things were prominent in his mind. Number one, stay alive, because it was very, very dangerous. And number two, absorb everything he could about what was going on, because he wanted to accurately portray, both in his writings and in his artwork, what the Marines faced. How cool is that? Tom Lee put his life on the line to paint the truth, not a slacker. Getting the truth and telling the truth matters big time. Because of Tom Lee, we know what World War II is like today. A U.S. bomber, the Enola Gay, dropped the first atomic bomb and the Japanese still didn't surrender. So number two was unloaded on Nagasaki. But you probably didn't know that there was drama between the admirals before the signing ceremony. So after the dropping of the atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 
1945, the Japanese sued for peace, unconditional surrender. In the first part of September in 1945, the surrender documents had been prepared and uh, the representatives of Japan, Allied forces, and the United States were going to sign them on the USS Missouri there in Tokyo Bay. That morning, uh, Admiral Halsey had put out a message to all ships that when the Japanese came on board the USS Missouri, they were to take away any sidearms or swords or other type of instruments of war, if you will, that they had. Second, that they would not be served anything to drink or any food. Admiral Nimitz saw that message and immediately countermanded it, put out a message to all ships saying, the war is over. When the Japanese come on board the USS Missouri, you will treat them like representatives from any other foreign government. Surrender documents were signed by both sides. I can totally relate to wanting to retaliate against the Japanese for what they did to us. But Admiral Nimitz saw the big picture and he knew belittling the Japanese was not in our long-term best interest for either country. And that was the end of World War II. 60 million lives were lost for our freedom. That just goes to show our freedom is really not free. Think about it. Listen to this story about how Admiral Nimitz went above and beyond to preserve the dignity of Japan. An interesting story, not published everywhere, is that Admiral Nimitz immediately got up, he took a platoon of Marines, he got in a launch, went across Tokyo Bay to Yokosuka, where there was a ship, the Japanese ship Makasa, which had been Tojo's flagship in a battle in 1905, and it was a historic relic to the Japanese. The United States and the Soviet Union wanted to destroy it. Admiral Nimitz put that platoon of Marines around that ship and said, the war's over, we should not destroy this ship, and in fact, I will donate $100 to start the renovation. If you go to Yokosuka today, you will see the Japanese ship Mikasa, beautiful ship, and there's a bronze plaque honoring Admiral Nimitz for what he did to save that ship. When you are victorious, it's not a good idea to rub your opponent's nose in their defeat. Just leave their dignity alone, and maybe you could be friends like the US and Japan are today.